Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Carnegie Mini Symposium on Quality Control in Biology, from cellular systems to ecosystems. As scientists, we're fascinated by nature. We see order and beauty on every single level of organization, from the nucleotides composing our genetic code and the iconic double helix, through the complex organelles in our cells conducting thousands of chemical reactions the intricate patterns of tissues and the complex 3D architecture of organs, all the way to the diverse ecosystems, such as the Great Barrier Reef. We observe these structures and processes, and we presume perfection. However, nature is not perfect, and to sustain life, a fragile equilibrium must be maintained. And as we all learned the hard way in 2020, not everything goes as planned. Mistakes happen. Mutations occur in the genetic code. Cellular organelles fail to perform their dedicated chemical reactions. Cells hyper or hypoproliferate, deforming the tissues they build. And the communities of microbes are jeopardized by new invasive species. And although one can imagine a myriad of problem situations that can challenge biological systems, nature is rarely caught off guard. At every level of organization, we can find an arsenal of quality control factors tied together in robust networks, protecting cells, tissues, organs, and organisms. These quality control systems are almost as diverse as the processes they protect. And our speakers today might even argue that they're more exciting to study. And I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to hear the exciting biology our speakers are gonna share with us today. So without further ado, I'll let Ross introduce the first session and our speakers. So we've conceptually organized this symposium to begin with quality control mechanisms on small length scales. And then throughout the day, we're gonna to graduate to higher order quality control systems um, sort of as the day progresses. This morning, we're gonna hear about quality control pathways that occur within cells. And we'll begin with kind of macromolecular quality control pathways. So the, the one that we, the macromolecular quality co control pathway that I think um, lots of molecular biologists are used to thinking about is protein quality control. Um, these are the kinds of like unfolded protein response pathways um, and these sorts of classic topics in molecular biology. But today we're gonna to hear from two speakers who have done really fascinating research on quality control mechanisms outside of conventional protein degradation pathways. Um, so our first speaker is Joshua Rosenthal from the Marine Biology Laboratory um, at Woods Hole. And he, his lab uses a cephalopod model to study site-directed um, site directed editing of mRNAs following transcription. Uh, so sort of an mRNA quality control pathway. Um, so with that, I'd just like to, um, to uh, give the floor to Dr. Rosenthal. Um, we're looking forward to hearing about your work. I really, yeah, thanks for the postdocs. I'm, I, I feel like I'm Zooming home in the sense that both sides of my family are actually from Baltimore originally. And um, yeah, it's a shame I couldn't get to, get to go to Carnegie in person, but um, I've been there before and I've always been very impressed. Um, I learned a while ago that if you don't, if you're going to be talking about cephalopods and you don't show an actual video of the organism, the audience tends to zone out and not like your talk. So, so here is your um, the eye candy for for cephalopods to start off with. We're starting with a picture of a veined op octopus off of Australia who has found a broken bottle and knows that using this transparent material. It, would, it will provide it protection. You'll see a, a, a fish come in in the upper corner at one point. Oh, okay. And then here we have what we call a mimic octopus off of Indonesia who uses, um, uses their legs to locomote and to cause camouflage at the same time, either looking like a seaweed where it can change its skin, its texture, its colors to look exactly like a seaweed or to look like a, a rock on the bottom that's walking away. Um, so the point here, and I think the point for a lot of people who look at cephalopods 
is that these, these organisms are incredibly sophisticated in terms of their behaviors, but they, they split off from the vertebrate trajectory somewhere between 500 and 800 million years ago. So here we are, the chordates and the vertebrates and um, going up through the mollusk to the cephalopods here. So they really provide a unique opportunity um, as the only extant group taxon to show this behavioral sophistication that's outside of this vertebrate lineage. Um, I look at things on the RNA level. So I think at first it's, it's, it's worthwhile to sit in and think a little bit why you might want to manipulate RNA molecules instead of DNA. So we know, and specifically everyone thinking about CRISPR these days, that if you make changes in DNA, if an organism makes changes in DNA, they're, they're permanent for the life of that, at least that cell, and often for something like a neuron, the life of that organism. Whereas RNA um, is a transient molecule. So if you make changes in RNA, not only can you create diversity, from the genetic blueprint, but you can also erase those changes and remake them according to conditions. This is all in, in theory. So RNA really is a much more flexible molecule than DNA in terms of genetic output. Um, proteins in general are, are more difficult to manipulate universally because it's just like trying to change the finished machine instead of changing the plans for a machine. Um, why might you want to do this? This was my one of my first years in Woods Hole after moving there from Puerto Rico, where in July it was quite nice and sunny, but here's the same the same area basically, Buzzards Bay in the winter, completely frozen over like the Arctic, and and the organisms that live year round in this, in this kind of environment, ex, you know, face extreme challenges. Another reason to want to manipulate RNA um, has to do with spatial considerations on top of temporal considerations. So I talked in the previous slide a second about why you might want to change RNA temporarily, but there's also good reasons because it gives you flexibility in terms of spatial encoding. Your DNA, right, is sequestered in the nucleus. Um, the same information in the DNA is then spread out in the proteins that are encoded by it um, all across the nerve cell or all across any cell for that matter. Um, for RNA, RNA exists in many departments and we're learning more and more that it can be translated outside of the cell body. So in a sense, you can create diversity within a cell, depending on how you want to translate messenger RNAs, because it already is spatially, spatially divided. Um, I work on a system of RNA editing called RNA editing by adenosine deamination. Um, it's carried out by the ADAR family of enzymes. ADARs are relatively simple. So in this cartoon, we have here a fictitious messenger RNA that folds back on itself to form some higher order structure. And ADARs are composed of two basic domains. Um, in green, we have these double-stranded RNA binding domains that find normally imperfect double-stranded structures in messenger RNA. And then they position a catalytic domain here in blue adjacent to adenosine that's going to be edited. If you zoom in on this reaction, here again, we have the messenger RNA um, with the adenosine. Here at the number six position, we have a primary amine where that 8R catalyzes a hydrolytic deamination to a carbonyl oxygen. So it's a relatively simple reaction. It's just a simple deamination of this position. However, um, this molecular entity is now inosine. And if you look at inosine, at this position, it looks very much like G. And that has consequences to Watson and Crick base pairing. 
So for instance, A usually base pairs with U in RNA, but I in a scene like G base pairs with C. Now, there are in a scenes all over every kind of RNA you can think of contain in a scenes. The most common target are actually transcribed repetitive elements. In a scenes are long on coding RNAs, viral RNAs when they get injected into the cell or get tra um, transcribed into the cell can be edited. That means have adenosines converted into inosines, siRNAs. Introns can get edited and that'll change splicing patterns. Untranslated regions can get edited and that can change message stability. Um, but the first focus and what I focus my whole career on is looking at inosines and messenger RNAs and the coding sequence of messenger RNAs because when they're there, they have the capacity to recode codons and change proteins. Um, so early in my career, basically by comparing genomic DNA sequence and messenger RNA sequence in individuals, I discovered an unusual number of editing sites in a few transcripts I was looking at. I, I, I started my career in ion channel biophysics, so I started looking at ion channels, and I found things like, you know, 18 editing sites in the first um, potassium channel message that I looked at, 13 in another one, 18 in another one. In a sodium channel message, I found 45 editing sites. This seemed, this seemed odd, but then we thought, well, maybe this is an ion channel specific thing going on in squid. Um, we then looked at ion transporters and found editing sites in the sodium calcium exchanger and the sodium potassium ATPase. I also then looked at the messages encoding the RNA editing enzymes themselves and found that they were richly edited. All in all, I found just in this handful of messages, close to 140 editing sites. And this was more than at the time than all other labs had found in, in mammals, essentially. So that gave us a hint that something strange was going on in squid and maybe in cephalopods in general. Um, so the basic question was, how extensive is RNA editing really in squid? Is it something like this, a rare phenomenon, like in most organisms, or is it an abundant one? And in order to do that, we were faced, we were confronted with a couple of challenges. The first is when we started this work, um, you know, Illumina sequencing was coming out. We had the ability to really look at editing instead of at individual transcripts. We could look at it transcriptome-wide. However, we didn't have a published genome from squid. And in general, in order to know where you're looking with Illumina reads, you have to map them to a genome. If you don't map them to a genome, which is essentially an anchor point to tell you what you're looking at with your reads, you're, you're in trouble. So we decided to turn this on our head and on its head and essentially um, take a slightly different approach where we did massive Illumina sequencing in both genomic DNA and RNA from individual squid and mapped it to a de novo transcriptome that we constructed. Um, the details here are in this Alan et al. eLife paper. But in essence, this limited us a little bit to looking at editing sites only in the um, coding regions of messenger RNAs because they had they were sufficiently complex to be able to map our reads unambiguously. Untranslated regions posed problems. So when we did this, we came out with a really surprising result. And here I'll give you a simple. On this graph, I'm showing on the x-axis nucleotide pairs, A or C, A or G, et cetera, and then the number of discrepancies. So a here means it would be in a positions where we found A in the, um, hold on. Sorry, that should work now. It should be A in the genomic DNA, but C in the, at some positions in the, at this position, sometimes in the RNA. 
And what you see clearly, for instance, this would be C in genomic DNA, but G sometimes in the RNA at, at a specific position. And what you see is we compared comparable size data sets for squid, human, and rhesus macaque from the brain and found this enormous peak where we found A in the DNA, but G sometime in the cDNA in only in squid. There are close to 100,000 instances of this across the transcriptome. Um, and so we went, I'm not going to have time to go through the validations we went. We did extensive validations of these events using Sanger sequencing with MySeq and even mass spec. And essentially what we got is something, uh, it came out as results of something like this. I'll throw this first look on the right side where the fraction of mRNAs that have a recoding site based on this process. That's the fraction of messenger RNAs where a codon is converted. And you see roughly two thirds of all squid messenger RNAs in the brain um, are recoded to some extent. And if you look at that, the number of recoding sites that are discovered, here we have a log scale. In squid, they're orders of magnitude higher than the nearest competitor, which would be Drosophila. Um, in, in human transcriptin, we really have only, oh, nowadays it might be a little higher than this slide, but one or 200 bona fide RNA editing sites that recode codons. In squid, we have close to 60,000. C. elegans, there's, uh, at best, there are eight. Some argue there are none. Flies, there are several hundred. Mouse, there are only about 38 recoding sites. So this is clearly something that's something interesting that is going on in, in squid. And then we wanted to ask, do we see a similar thing in, in across cephalopods? In particular, the soft bodied cephalopods or the coleoid cephalopods, because these are the ones that in general are displaying these very complex behavioral patterns. And those are octopus, um, squid, cuttlefish. Nautilus is a nice outgroup because um, it's the only extant cephalopod um, that we have that that's, has a hard shell around it and does not really demonstrate this kind of behavioral sophistication. And so when we did a similar kind of analysis um, across two species of octopus, Nautilus, squid, and also a plesia, an out, a molluscan outgroup, we saw again this A to G Geno variation between the genome and the transcriptome, huge peaks of it, only in the coleoid cephalopods. We did not see this in Nautilus and we did not see this in Aplesia. Um, interesting thing is when you map where these recoding sites are, they're recoding entire systems and they aren't evenly, evenly divided across the neural transcriptome. For instance, what we see is things like pathways that are involved with um, synaptic vesicle cycle, cycling in presynaptic terminals. Pretty much every message in squid that we could identify was either heavily edited or edited to some extent. There are some messages in the typical mammalian um, synaptic vesicle cycle that we, we, we couldn't identify or we couldn't annotate in the squid. But basically everything that we could annotate was heavily edited. And this is just an example. We see a similar trend in things like um, RNAs encoding proteins that are involved in excitability, voltage-dependent ion channels, et cetera. And such that the editing was really skewed towards those um, transcripts that encode proteins that really are make nervous systems specific that are encoding nervous system specific functions. Um, and again, in octopus, cuttlefish, or squid, in each case, about two thirds of the neural transcriptome, um, the messages in the neural transcriptome have at least one editing site, recoding editing site in them. So I wanna give a, a little bit of an, you know, an idea of what cephalopods can do with this editing. Um, so the first question, the, almost the easiest thing to manipulate environmentally is temperature. Um, and so we wanted to see, does temperature change the way edit, change editing at editing sites? In order to do this, we took 
species of octopus called octopus bimaculoides. Um, they're very robust in culture. We incubated them for six weeks, raised them at two different temperatures. We had to slowly acclimate them for a week or so. And then we incubated them for what we consider a long time. Um, dissected out after the stage, um, uh, peripheral ganglion, common peripheral ganglion that we know is heavily edited and quantified editing levels across the transcriptome, okay? And look for ones that changed, okay? Where the editing level changed based on the temperature environment. And then we repeated this experiment again for validity. Um, and what we found was something interesting in that most of the sites didn't change, okay? About three quarters of the sites didn't change here. But about, a, oh, about a, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the sites were temperature dependent. And in almost all cases, they were edited to a greater extent in the cold animals than in the warm animals. So here we have the editing percentage in the warm minus cold. And you can see it's very skewed such that the cold editing percentages are larger. There were a few cases where this was true for the warm animals, but in general, cold temperatures induced higher editing. Um, we also tried a similar experiment in squid where we dissected out the ganglion and cultured them for a week, and we saw something similar. Oh, in this case, roughly about 20% of the editing sites were temperature sensitive, and the vast majority of those were cold temperature sensitive as well. Um, quickly, looking at some of these temperature sensitive sites, we wanted to see in, in culture ganglia how quickly it took for them to go from one editing level to another. We looked at a whole bunch of different sites and basically to make a long story short, we switched them both from cold to warm temperatures and warm to cold temperatures. And in each case, it takes, oh, um, these are all statistically significant changes. And luckily, in, in general, we could recapitulate the same changes whether going from cold to warm or warm to cold. Um, and they usually reached a new steady state level within about four days of changing temperatures. This is important. This is interesting because it gives you an idea of, of what the organisms, how they can deploy this process, whether it's for a very fast temperature change or sl more slow temperature change or seasonal temperature change. And our data suggests it takes about four days um, to, to make a change. So something like changing thermoclines, this might, system might not be useful for, for a squid. However, for a seasonal change temperature, perhaps it will be. Um, we have a lot of publications in the past looking at the effects of individual editing sites on protein function. We've seen that it can affect tetramerization in potassium channels or gating characteristics of potassium channels or the transport velocity in the sodium potassium ATPase. Here are a couple examples. But today I wanted to give you a quick run through on two sites that I find really exciting. These are two temperature sensitive sites in messages encoding proteins that are very important for nervous system function. Um, Synaptotagmin, which is a calcium sensor, a major calcium sensor in presynaptic termini, and kinesin, which is the um, major anterior grade molecular motor in neurons. So in um, synaptotagmin, we, this synaptotagmin participates in, in helping with other proteins, helping the synaptic vesicles fuse to the presynaptic mes um, membrane so they can dump out their neurotransmitter when calcium enters the presynaptic terminal from calcium channel. So we have calcium binding sites, they change the conformation and they help the synaptic vesicles fuse. We found a single edit, one editing site in the C2A domain um, that was edited about close to 20, about 20% 20 of the time at 22 degrees, but 43% of the time at 12 degrees. Um, simple chains, isoleucine to valine, a single methyl group is being removed. Um, so in collaboration with Brian Sutton at Texas Tech, crystallized both the edited, edited and the unedited form. Here in purple, you see the site of the isoleucine to valine change. And it makes a subtle change here in a beta sheet. You can see as it coming down, 
basically um, helping to extend a beta sheet in this area. We didn't know what this was going to do because the calcium binding here you see with these red dots and the domain that's re responsible for lipid fusion is up here. And so um, Brian tested these two different versions in their ability to either bind calcium or bind phospholipids, which is sort of a surrogate for binding the plasma membrane. Um, he had estimated calcium binding affinities by ITC and phospholipid binding by stop flow experiments. And there are two binding sites for calcium and found that the editing basically cut one of the, you know, reduced affinity for calcium by about, by, by in half at one of the sites and then slightly increased at another site. What was more interesting though, almost was the phospholipid binding where we see that the um, edited version has a much lower affinity for phospholipid. So it goes down about 40 fold. Okay, this is relatively recent. This is where we are with this project. Quickly go on to the um, kinesin. Kinesin, as you know, walks along microtubules by copying between alpha and beta tubulin. The editing site is a lysine to an arginine change right here in the motor domain. It looks like the feet down here. Um, and again, a very conservative change of lysine to arginine, maintaining the same charge. But it is at a point that is predicted to be in contact with tubulin. So if you take a look at this, we looked at this across 162 species of kinesin and saw that a lysine at this position is absolutely conserved. So that's giving us some idea that maybe even a conservative change is going to change, could change things. Um, again, this site goes through large changes in editing level. Um, we did an experiment going in, in, in squid ganglia going from 14 to 24 degrees. And you see editing levels either uh, at, at about um, going up to, you know, about 60% when you go from warm to cold and then going down from 60 to about 20% when you go from cold to warm. Um, so the way we just started looking at this was we made this motor domain of kinesin um, with part of the stalk and attached GFP to it. This is a fairly standard approach for the people who look at kinesin for a living. Um, and then we are looking, starting to look at the dynamics of the edited and the unedited versions as they move across microtubules. So here, take a look at the spot. This is looking at... Um, the recombinant octopus kinesin moving across microtubules via using turf microscopy. Um, and you can see here an example of movement. This is the unedited kinesin as it moves across the microtubule. Um, at this point, we've gotten collected our first data sets. I'm not gonna show you the edited form because you just can't distinguish the difference from your eye, but our preliminary data seems to suggest that the edited form is moving faster than the unedited form across along microtubules. Okay, the last little thing I'm going to get to really quickly is our, our data that there is spatial, re spatial regulation of editing in squid neurons as well. Um, canonical RNA editing in other organisms goes on in the nucleus. We see that it's because the structures that ADARs recognize usually form between introns and exons and pre-messenger RNAs. Um, ADAR itself is nuclear localized. But squid provide you this one neat little trick is that you can dissect out the giant axon and squeeze out axoplasm from it. This is pure cytoplasm from the axon and analyze it biochemically. When we do this, I'm starting to run out of time, I'm sorry. We see a very nice ADAR2 signal in the axoplasm. This is in the cell body as well. When we do immunostaining too, we see ADAR signal outside of the nuclei as well in various um, neuronal sections as well. We even see a bright ADAR signal in the plexiform layer, which is a layer of synaptic connections. Um, when we squeeze out axoplasm, we can do a transcript axoplasmic transcriptome-wide editing analysis through RNA-seq. 
and also compare that to the cell bodies where the nuclei are. And when we do that, we see that we have a very large number of editing sites that are edited more highly in axons, very small number that are edited more highly in the cell bodies and a group that is statistically unchanged. So we see ADAR outside of the nucleus. Um, we see that editing sites in the same message when you isolate it from axons are more extensively edited very frequently than they are in the nucleus. This is giving us an indication that there can be local editing of messages. Okay, to wind up, I just wanna give you a quick idea of what we are working hypothesis on what's going on here evolutionarily. This is just an idea we're gonna looking through to try to change that. But if you look at all the editing sites in SQUID, you'll see that we have a tremendous number that are edited at very low percentages, but then a small number that get out and are edited at fairly high percentages. Um, so what we think is somewhere evolutionarily between Nautilus and the coleoid cephalopods, a change happened, perhaps ADAR gained greater access to messenger RNA. This led to low level editing across structures that were in RNA and in sites where this was beneficial, those were in a few sites where this was beneficial, that was, they were selected and have, have been selected and are edited at greater and greater percentages by, by basically improving those structures over, over evolutionary time. Um, this work has been done by a lot of people over the years. I'm just gonna call out Matt Burke, who's a postdoc in the lab now, has been doing the kinesin and synaptotagment and the temperature sensitive editing work. Ellie Eisenberg, who is a collaborator of mine, a longtime collaborator at Tel Aviv University, um, expert bioinformatician. Um, Roger Sutton at Texas Tech, who does the X-ray crystallography. Kristen um, Verhe at University of Michigan, who's been helping a lot with the kinesin assays. And Namrata, who I'm gonna point out now, who I haven't talked about, has gotten CRISPR-Cas working in cephalopods. Um, happy to take any questions from you guys. And I really thank you for the opportunity.